All right, uh, this talk's called The Black Art of Binary Hi Hijacking. Uh, just tried to come up with a clever title. Uh, it's not really a black art, it's fairly straightforward, but um, something that hasn't been particularly automated in the past, and that's what I'm trying to accomplish here. Uh, so first off, I'm gonna talk about a little bit the overview of persistence techniques, how malware stays persistent, or how a pen tester would essentially get something to be persistent on a network if, he was, if that's what he's trying to do. Uh, I'll talk about the, the Binject tool, which is basically my approach to automating um, persistence through binary hijacking specifically. Uh, and I'll go through uh, some of the major techniques it supports. It actually supports quite a few other things that I'm not going to talk about, um, but you can download it and you know run the tool with the dash H option and see some of the other things it supports. Um, it supports a few different process injection style parasites. I'll talk about those. Uh, and since I'm on the pr topic of process injection parasites, I'll talk about a new method for process injection uh, that will be implemented soon in the tool. There's already space for it in the command line options, but it's not quite ready for prime time yet. <clears throat> All right, so persistence mechanisms on a Windows system. Uh, the most easy is the, the startup folders. Of course, all you have to do is copy a file over there. Very easy to detect. Same with the registry run keys. As you move on down this list, uh, you can see kind of the, the level of difficulty required to install something is pretty much matches how difficult it is to um, detect. The very last one on the list is what I call DLL search order hijacking. It's still very easy to install. Uh, very, very, very difficult to detect. Um, this is not what this talk is about. We have a blog post about that that I wrote uh, week and a half, two weeks ago or so, I recommend you going out to the Mandiant blog if you haven't read that blog post. <clears throat> but anyway, the next lowest one down on this list here is binary hi hijacking. Still pretty difficult to detect from a forensic perspective. Um, this basically involves, you know, just taking a binary that does something already that is loaded when the system boots and just adding functionality to it. Uh, all right. <clears throat> so what Binject is, it's a pretty simple command line interface tool. Uh, you just run it. It only has a few command line options. Really hard to mess up. Uh, but it, it does a lot of functionality. And really the, the tools um, and the impetus for me writing this tool is that I've been writing these techniques in individual little one-off programs for the last, I don't know, four years or so. And I finally just decided to consolidate them all and make one kind of all you need to infect binaries kind of tool. <clears throat> And this isn't necessarily just malicious, like I said. We, I'll talk about some legitimate uses of some of this stuff in a minute, but um, anyway. Um, one of the things you can do is, the most basic thing is just add new sections to a binary. Nothing particularly groundbreaking about that. It does have a very good uh, algorithm for adding sections, and I'll, uh, if we have time at the very end and I, I can pull up PEView and show you some examples, uh, I can show you where my tool succeeds and other tools fail. Um, but if you just wanted to add data, inside a binary, you know, to, I don't know, very crude steg or something like that. The tool supports it. Um, basic entry, whoops, basic entry point redirection. So if you add on a new piece of data, you can specify the, the permissions of that section. So you can say you want it to be an executable section. Uh, and we can very easily just redirect the entry point of the binary to that section. So now when this binary starts up, it's going to start executing your code instead of the real code. Um, <clears throat> that's just what I call entry point redirection. Also, it also supports entry point hooking, uh, which would be something like this. This is an entry point hook stub for a DLL. So when you have a DLL, the problem with a DLL is it's going to be loaded anywhere in memory. You don't have any really way to guarantee where that DLL is going to be loaded. Uh, and with a hook, an entry point hook, we want our code to run first and then at some point jump back to the original code so that the DLL works as intended. Uh, so I just prepend this little sequence of instructions here. What I basically do is I take the delta, which is the difference between the, uh, the memory address right after the call instruction and where the original entry point is, and using this sequence, I'm actually able to build up a, a real pointer in memory and push it on the top of the stack to your shell code. So all you have to do is make sure your shell code will take basically a parameter, um, and you can use that. You can jump back to it at the end, or you just do the return instruction, and the return will actually jump back. Um, by default to whatever's on the top of the stack. So pretty simple system here for doing entry point redirection. Uh, that's very basic feature. Uh, here's the feature we use more often in, in our line of work, uh, entry point table poisoning. So I have the ability to modify the import table to add on imports. Um, this technology's been around for a while, particularly with the Microsoft Detours library. Uh, however, the Detour library will add it, I think, by default 
to the very end. I don't, I'm not sure if there's a way to, uh, to modify that behavior. So when a binary loads, it basically walks through the import uh, list of all the DLLs loaded and it loads them in that order. Uh, so the, the trick of mine is that whenever you say you want a specific DLL to be loaded, it will actually load first and not last. Um, this is, we use this system for kind of an internal project where we want to do some uh, behavioral analysis on malware. So we want some, some of our code to execute inside the process first before the malware executes. So all we do is we packaged our code inside of a DLL and we use the entry point or the uh, import table poisoning to force the binary, no matter how it's launched, it can be launched as a service or whatever, no matter how it's launched, it's going to execute our DLL before it does anything else in the process. <clears throat> Even the entry point. It, DLLs get loaded and executed before the entry point. So. Another thing we got happening here is the automated installation of TLS callbacks. Uh, some of you might be familiar with this. Uh, it's kind of one of those somewhat malicious techniques used out there. Not all that common though. Uh, this is initially a thread, part of the whole thread system. You know, you can have threads that have their own unique pieces of memory and you can have callback functions that can initialize them. Uh, but basically the, the, why this is useful from an attacker perspective is TLS callbacks execute before the entry point of a binary. So if you attack a, a, attach a little piece of malicious code to a TLS callback in a binary, um, you have full access to do anything to that process um, before anything in the binary runs. So if you wanted like to have some anti-VMware or anti-debugger detection, um, TLS callbacks are a pretty novel place to put that data because when you open it up in Ali debug with default settings, the TLS callback is already executed. You don't, ha you know, it's not automatically going to pause at that location. You can configure it to pause, but it's not the default behavior. Uh, and this is, of course, if user32.dll is loaded. Something in the user32.dll call chain actually forces these things to be loaded. Um, oops. And as I was saying, this is a fairly easy to use program. So all you have to do to force a TLS callback to be created with your code, your shell code that you could have generated with Metasploit, is this simple little command line down here at the bottom. Binject dash, dash I, you give it a clean executable. Dash O, you give it an output executable. Um, dash D, you specify your data, which in this case would be shell code. And you just say dash T or dash dash TLS, and it's going to install that block of data as a TLS callback. There's some other utility wrapping functionality. Um, right now I have the um, basic command line wrapping. So this tool, the whole idea of this tool is we want to add functionality to an existing binary, a compiled binary. Um, there's lots of, you know, somewhat malicious or um, behavioral analysis type uses for that, but I also have some basic command line uses for that. One of them being I have a binary and I just want it to have a fixed command line. So all I, I can just double click it and it's always going to run with this specific set of arguments. So here's an example of uh, wrapping, you know, netcat dash or netcat.exe to make it a persistent, a backdoor that only, all you have to do is make sure netcat gets launched and it's always going to get launched to create a reverse shell. This reverse shell will connect out to fake.com on a certain port and launch command shell connected to it. Um, eventually I'd also like to get a, a function put in here to, to attach, you know, a fixed set of standard input to a binary, that sort of thing. Uh, and this whole thing works via entry point redirection. So I redirect the entry point before the process starts. Um, I get all this stuff set up. I change around the, uh, the command line arguments and all that stuff in memory. Uh, it works pretty, pretty well. Um, so this is, that's the basic functionality, just you have a piece of shell code or something like that you, that you wrote completely from scratch, it does everything you want it to do. Um, so any, any more advanced functionality you would have to write on your own at that, with those features. I do have the ability to add in some pre-made parasites. So for example, we had some shell code or something that we wanted to actually not just run before the binary, but we wanted to actually be you know, process injected into something else. Um, so if I have a piece of shell code I wanted to be process injected into, services.exe, I can use the, uh, there's a couple different methods for that. Um, well, first thing you have to do when you're process injecting is, you know, you have to allocate memory in the process, then you have to write your data over there with the, these two function calls normally. Uh, getting the code to execute, there's a couple different methods for it. 
Um, the first most common one is you know, create remote thread. This will basically force another process to start executing at a location of your choosing. Once you've allocated memory there and you've written your code there, it uh, doesn't take a rocket science to, to figure out that this could be potentially malicious as well. Um, this pretty much always works. Create remote thread. Uh, there's some uh, cases now with Windows 7 and above where uh, they're starting to restrict the, the usefulness of this, but uh, for the most time it, it always works. Other techniques like QUser APC, there's not much documentation out there on them. They're not very popular techniques. Um, QUser APC will force a, a process that supports APC, which is asynchronous procedure calls, it will basic, which is a, basically a queue of functions that that process is going to execute whenever it uh, works on this APC uh, mechanism. Not all processes do. There's some key, uh, key processes that do use APC. For example, services.exe uses asynchronous procedure calls. So you can use QUser APC to force services.exe to execute something of your choosing. So it's pretty effective in that case. It wouldn't be effective against, say, like, uh, you couldn't queue user APC against Netcat. It's just, it doesn't use APC. It doesn't make those function calls. So it's never going to process an APC function that's, that's added to its queue. Uh, <clears throat> uh, another technique, it's not fully implemented in my tool yet. So I went ahead and posted the, the proof of concept code on my website along with the tool. Um, so you can at least see how, the, how I'm doing this technique and it will eventually be, make its way into Binject as well. Um, so there's, here's another technique. Instead of cr create remote thread and uh, queue user APC, in order to get uh, code to execute in that process at our specific location, uh, this basically technique is called thread hijacking. Um, what I do is I find a thread that I want to hijack, which would typically be like the main thread of a process. So if I find services.exe, well, that one's going to be kind of dangerous, but I would find maybe explorer.exe. Uh, we suspend the main thread. Um, I do a get thread context to save off all the register context. Um, then I allocate space for my new code. And the key difference here is I also allocate a new stack. So I'm going to make a completely new stack, completely new area for my code. Uh, what's not in the slides here is that I actually do kind of a loop with the get thread context. Uh, I'm basically checking to see if I'm executing inside of NTDLL. If I'm executing inside of NTDLL, chances are I could be waiting for an operating system uh, function to return. It gets problematic when you try to resume after you've cleared out your malicious code. Uh, if you're waiting for that to resume, that can be you can get a lot of crashes that way. So I actually execute in a loop with get thread context waiting for EIP to be outside of NTDLL. Uh, that, that's a side note though. So all you want to do is save off that thread context, allocate your new code, your new stack, set thread context to set EIP to the new code and set the stack pointer to the new stack. Then you can just resume the thread and that new, um, the new code that you allocated in that process is going to start executing, which is pretty neat. That in and of itself is somewhat useful, but then you've just broken the entire original process. That's not cool, especially if it's explorer.exe. You know, they're going to kill the process pretty quickly. Um, so the difference here is now we're going to actually, whatever shell code you injected over there, it has to basically suspend itself when it's done. Just call suspend thread and, and, and call it a day. Once you've suspended yourself, uh, the actual, um, whatever process is doing the hijacking can then uh, set thread context back to the original context and then call resume thread. So what we've done is we've taken a thread, which is normally would just keep executing whatever it wants, we've stopped it, we've hijacked it for a period of time and then set it back to the original. So in that period of time it actually continues going as if nothing had